Welcome back to the Meeple Marathon and our continued coverage of Hour of Need. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how to set up and play Hour of Need. Um, <clears throat> it is a, a pretty quick setup, um, which is part of their draw of the modular deck system. And it's a pretty straightforward uh, gameplay. I feel like the rule book uh, convolutes things a lot. Um, moves some things around, um, over explains some stuff. So hopefully this will clear up any questions that you might have had. Um, because for me, it took kind of several read throughs of certain sections of the rule book, uh, some looking, reviewing stuff online to really kind of get it all down. So <clears throat> hopefully this will help. But let's talk about setup first. Um, so basically you're going to go through your, uh, all your cards and you're going to pull out whatever however many heroes you're playing with pull out that deck you're going to pull out one set of villain cards in this case we are playing against the dowager or dowager and then an issue deck and in this case we're going to play century heist and each issue deck comes with a specific board so this is the board for century heist um, so you cannot mix and match boards with issues. You can mix and match villains and heroes with any issue, but the issue and the board are always connected. Okay? So let's talk about the issue first and how we uh, set that up. So it's important to note that each issue has one of these uh, setup cards here. It looks exactly the same on the back, but uh, obviously it's a little different on the front. So. It says, for setup, remove the vault from the issue deck and place it in the issue play area sealed side up. Okay, so that's what I've gone ahead and done. I've pulled out this card here and uh, it's on the sealed side up and that's basically all we do for right now. It also has some special rules here which are quite important. Uh, in this instance, it says, after a hero attacks the villain, they may discard one justice from the vault to return one issue token from the villain card to the vault. If there are ever three issue tokens on this card, the villain has escaped with the gold and the heroes lose. I'm gonna get back to that in a second, but it's just important to know because the first time I played, I didn't really understand what that was meaning and there was something else I didn't do. And we'll I'll tell you what that is here in just a second. You also always wanna find the four scheme cards that go along with the particular uh, issue. And you'll notice, I'm just gonna flip them over quickly, they do not match the back. They are double-sided and there's you know important stuff on the back. But you'll notice that these pictures here match the pictures that are in these scheme panels off to the side. So that's how you can keep up with, okay, these belong to uh, Century Heist. Uh, if you were to pull these out on the opposite side of the board, the pictures wouldn't match, so you would know you've got the wrong set of scheme cards. These do not get mixed in with the rest of the deck. Uh, basically, we pulled out, we have our setup card here, we pulled out the vault card, sealed side up, and we shuffled the rest of these. These, however, always get pulled out, and you're gonna kinda blindly shuffle them at this point. You know, shuffle them as best you can without looking, and then each hero, in the game is going to get one of these uh, added to their threat area from the very beginning. So I'm closing my eyes here and just shuffling these up and we'll take this one. Okay, so we have exclusive news edition. That means this is kind of the, the scheme we're going to have to solve in order to bring Dowager out into the open and uh, then uh, get to the point where we can actually start attacking her. So these three schemes get removed. Uh, from this particular game. Go put them back in the box because you're not going to need them for right now. <clears throat> Just going to put them there for right this minute. So um, this essentially equates to this space here and also this space here. Think of this as like a zoomed out picture of the map. And so if I make it to this space, the newsroom is actually in this uh, tall skyscraper here. And as soon as I go here, I am technically in here and these are essentially the same space. But this allows for more stuff, more tokens and miniatures and things to be placed in it because more than just one person can occupy these spaces, whereas here only one miniature figure can occupy the hexes around the map. All right, but basically everybody's been given 
a starting scheme card. This little skull icon uh, is indicative on any card you see. If you see this card, it's gonna go into your player's threat area. So if you're familiar with the other modular deck system games, MDS games, you'll know that basically heroes uh, or characters start accumulating uh, cards in their threat area and at the end of their turn they're always going to have to activate those cards from left to right and so the more you allow to stack up here you know the worse off uh, between turns is going to be all right but that's basically the issue deck setup the villain setup is pretty straightforward you're going to pull out the deck and you just need to find the double-sided card it's the only one that's double-sided and this is essentially like the villain card this is going to give you you know their hit value this is the amount of value you need to once they become unhidden then you'll need to put justice on them you kind of this is indicative of you figuring out what she's doing what is dowager up to uh, so you need to solve uh, that problem by putting five justice tokens on her per person but that's after she has been uh, revealed now you reveal her you can see here by completing your scheme so at the beginning of the game, we're going to place, as part of the villain setup, one hidden token on the villain per player. So I'm playing a solo game, so I just put one hidden token, and I'm just going to cover up that five value there. That way, I don't try and solve her thing yet, because I can't. I don't know what she's doing. She hasn't made herself known yet. Okay, so we put the villain down on the scheming side up, um, and just know that to remove this token, we have to complete this uh, kind of scheme over here. The rest of the cards you're simply just going to shuffle up and put over here. It is important to note though that for scaling purposes of the game, if you are playing solo, you're going to go through the deck first and remove any that say one. So in a lot of cases you would only keep, in other decks you only keep cards that have one on it. In this case you're removing cards that say one uh, solo on them. This just reduces the amount of each particular card, um, making it more appropriate for a single player. There's also cards that say five and six on it. So if you're playing, if you have one of the expansions and you're playing up to six players, you would remove at a five or six player count, the ones that say five to six on them, these would get shuffled back in. Again, that's just for scaling purposes. Um, and the last thing you're gonna do as part of villain setup is you're going to take the villain miniature. I apologize, these aren't painted or anything like that. And they always start in the number one uh, scheme panel. So you can see one, two, three, four. These panels, uh, as well as being like zoomed in versions of a specific particular space, this is kind of the storyline. This is how the plot progresses. So you can see they're in an abandoned warehouse to begin with, they're planning how to break into the vault. Then they're actually going to go to the vault. And then they're actually going to, thematically, I don't know why they would run through the newsroom or bother putting themselves on the news. Maybe this is just indicative of the news picking up on the fact that the bank is being robbed. But then the last thing they're gonna do is try and escape through the subway tunnels. So that's why you always start, the villain always starts in the number one scheme area because that's the beginning of the plot. Also, um, it, you can check in the rule book. Um, once you start playing a couple times, you'll very quickly understand that each villain has a particular set of lackeys that come with them. There's also, if you look through their deck, you'll see the lackey cards. In this case, it's the goons. So you'd wanna pull out the four goon miniatures that match, or the four lackey miniatures that match the villain, and go ahead and place the rings on them because when you draw a goon card, it's going to be a specific color, red, blue, green, or whatever. And so having the rings on them already just is going to save you some time. All right, moving on to your hero deck. Again, your hero deck is the simplest of all. You simply find your specific hero card here. You're going to put it with the focused side down. Uh, focused side is just a beefed up version of your hero. You can get there by collecting and then spending five focus uh, at any given time to flip that card over. Otherwise, you just take the rest of your cards, you shuffle them up, and then you're going to deal four cards to yourself. This is your starting hand. Okay? Few other uh, kind of bookkeeping stuff that you want. You want to make sure you have your available tokens, your health and justice tokens over here, 
if you want a way to track uh, your actions that you spend, you can get two action tokens. These can just be flipped over to say, oh, I spent my two actions, my turn is done. Um, I personally don't really use these very well, but we'll put them over there anyways. You also wanna get out your clue cards. Your clue cards are the same for any issue, any villain, any hero that you play. These don't change. So if you have multiple sets, you have the base game and standalone expansions, you only need one set of clue cards. Otherwise, they are identical. Uh, keep the others in shrink. You're going to want to keep these four exclamation tokens handy uh, just because if a specific villain peril card comes out, you're going to place those tokens on the map. You're also going to pull out, uh, and yes, I have the upgraded miniatures version, but for the purposes of setup, it's just easier visually to not have so much gray plastic on, and these are much easier to see. You're going to pull out all eight bystander tokens and all 10 minion tokens and again i have minion miniatures but for the purposes of uh, this video it's just easier to see them as a token you want to pull them all out to begin with because there is a specific pool of those bystanders and minions and if you ever cannot place one on the board because you know they're all already out on the board or enough bystanders have been killed uh, you crisis happens and we'll talk about crisis during the how to play section so it's important to pull them all out and not just have them spread in uh, otherwise. You're going to go ahead then and put four bystanders on the bystander spaces. So you can see that image matches this token. Those are the only other things that go on the board other than your miniature, which goes here on this space. Don't know if it's always going to be in the center, but on this board it is. If you have more than one hero, you would just place the other ones around this space somewhere like that. The last thing that I'm going to point out during setup, which uh, is something I did not do in my first playthrough, I was excited and I just jumped right into playing, is get out your issue guide. Especially if it's the first time you've played an issue, there is some flavor text stuff in here um, that goes through like scheme introductions, things like that. So I could read the, uh, what is it, manufactured hysteria, yeah, which is my scheme. This is mostly flavor text, and all of this stuff down here is just flavor text. But this right here, these two boxes at the beginning are very important. This tells you the specific named tokens that you want to have handy, because they might come out during the game. So that's these right here. I've gone ahead and pulled those out. And then this right here, special rules and clarifications. Don't forget to solve the vault when it becomes opened. It may be the only way to delay the villain before they escape with the goal. Okay, very important text. And if we go back here to our special rules card, we'll see after a hero attacks the villain, they may discard one justice from the vault to return one issue token from the villain card to the vault. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and let you know right now, this shouldn't be a spoiler, especially if this is the first game you play. Um, I want you to be able to play it appropriately. The vault is gonna have issue tokens placed on it. That's these with the question marks. These represent gold bars that uh, get kind of placed into the vault and then Dowager's actually going to steal them from the vault and then she's going to escape with them. So they're gonna travel from the vault to her card and then to this uh, issue setup card. If all three make it to the issue setup card, you've lost. They've escaped with all three bars of gold. But there are lots of cards, for example, this one here with the 12 and the little pink cloud or dowager herself once we reveal her uh, on the other side of this card is a pink cloud without a number that's just uh, telling you that you can put justice tokens on that card and there's no limit to them it's never going to go away if you solve it but you can still take the solve action to place justice tokens on the vault and again by rem after you smack around the villain, if you have put justice tokens on the vault, it allows you to return gold to the vault. Think of it as majesty, like flying the gold back to the vault and making Dowager run back. You know, she's only gonna complete her mission if she runs off with three b bars of gold instead of two or one. So I did not get that. That was not clear in my first playthrough. Again, it would have been helpful if I had read the issue guide and kind of tried to figure out what the special rules were. Now it makes sense, uh, especially even thematically it makes sense, but it's not clear if you don't read everything that you're supposed to read. So 
that's a little tip for everyone. Make sure you read special rules and make sure you read those, at least what's in the yellow boxes in the issue guide. Okay, <clears throat> so that's setup, at least for Century Heist, that is the setup. But pretty much you set up your issue deck and you set up your board, you set up your villain and you set up your hero, you're good to go. Okay, so how do we go about playing a game of Hour of Need? Well, Hour of Need is broken up, a round of Hour of Need is broken up into three phases. The villain phase, the hero phase, which includes the hero taking actions and then resolving their threat area, and then the issue phase. Another tip for you, while we're talking about tips and tricks, is to go ahead and count the number of issue cards. There's nothing saying you can't, keeping these face down, count these, and I think I counted them earlier, it's like eight or nine. Um, but this is essentially the amount of rounds you have to accomplish your mission. Century Heist is rather quick. It's not a long mission, it's gonna go by quickly. So keep that in mind, if there's stuff going on on the board, you can't do everything. You're not gonna be able to save every bystander. Uh, you need to focus on what's gonna help you advance towards defeating the villain. In this case, it is completing this scheme and then uh, solving her and then attacking her. That's kind of got to be what your focus is because you only have nine rounds to do all of that. Once you've drawn this last card and you go to draw another one, the game's over. So um, you lose. You've taken too long and that's that. Um, so back to the individual phases. You always start the game with a villain phase. You're going to draw a card from the top of the villain deck per hero. Okay, so in this game, it's pretty straightforward because we're playing solo. But if you're playing two player, you would draw one, you would draw two, but you resolve them one at a time. So I'm going to flip this over and we're going to take a look at it. So this is the Widow's Trail. It's a ploy card and there's all this showdown text at the bottom of here. You actually can ignore that at the beginning of the game. This bottom half of the card that says showdown is completely ignored until you are actually going head to head with the villain you're attacking her, she's attacking you or him, and um, this is her way of kind of fighting back when you attack. So for right now, we're just gonna ignore it. The only thing we need to pay attention to here are these symbols right here. And we'll, we'll get this card a little closer because there's a lot of graphics on here, but you see a yellow X and a little bystander symbol. Well, you wanna make sure you have one of your handy dandy reference cards here because you can see that the icons on a ploy card mean various things. So in this instance, if we're matching these up, we're gonna place one minion in the yellow scheme, which is the century bank down here, and we're also going to place one bystander on the map. Um, or the villain captures one bystander if they're nearby. So we've got our reference card here. Basically, we're just doing these two things for the villain card. So we would take a bystander, we'd put them on the map somewhere. Um, since the bystander cannot go on the map, it is placed here uh, in what our scheme panel the villain is. So this, this bystander is captured. This one's still just kind of running around like a chicken with its head cut off. But uh, if, for example, these were off, you would just pick one of these to place the bystander in. Okay, and also you're gonna take a minion token and you're gonna place it in the yellow area. Again, remember that these are only finite in the number of minion tokens. So you have to, you can't let, you know, 10 of these minions accumulate, plus they are, are a nuisance. So, but that's it for this card. Well, let's take a look at some of the other cards, uh, type of cards you might see. Um, see, you can see here that uh, all of these cards have various numbers and differences in the icons at the top, but most of them are just the icons and then the showdown effect at the bottom. There's also ones like these that uh, don't have any icons. You simply do what the text says and move on. Then there are lackey cards. So lackey cards means that a uh, lackey miniature is being placed onto the board and you can see here's the skull icon so this lackey is going to go into majesty's threat area that just means that this lackey activates after majesty has taken her two actions so in this instance you would take 
the green stooge and he's going to start on the green basically at the the green stage scheme stage but he's out here on the board because he can actually move around okay remember the villain is hidden so she's not gonna be running around on the map she's hiding and minions don't move they simply stay put wherever they are and cause a nuisance but lackeys can actually move and attack you so instead of placing them here you're gonna place them here on the map and then when they activate they would go one two three and inflict which means attack they stay here until you have defeated them they have eight health <clears throat> in which case you would remove them gain a clue card and so forth uh, the other cards that you might see are peril cards remember I talked about keeping your peril tokens handy those are the exclamation mark tokens you can see this one has a skull symbol so it's going to go into our uh, threat area here and this is something we have to solve this is not someone we have to attack this is a problem we have to solve in this case it's a bomb that's been placed and you can see the card is blue this card was green so we put the green lackey out here now we're going to take the blue exclamation point and we're going to find the matching exclamation mark there so this is just telling me now that's where the bomb is uh, i have to address that within a couple turns or somebody's going to die in this case it says when it's activated if there's not a bystander token on here take one and put it on there then if it activates and there is a bystander token this bystander is killed remember at that point it's removed from the game uh, and you have one less bystander to put out if you're instructed to do so at that point this guy would be removed you failed but if you can make it over here and be adjacent to this space you can solve this problem once you get four justice on it you would remove him rescuing the bystander gaining a clue token that's pretty much uh, the extent of the villain cards at least for dowager some of the other villains may get slightly more complicated than this but you can see they're pretty straightforward as to the types of cards that you're going to see so that is the villain turn okay this is future me telling past me that i forgot to cover something as far as um managing the villain and that is advancing this is a keyword you're going to see in some of the cards it's going to say the villain advances and it took me a little while to go back and find this in the rule book it's not like a nice bold text so i'm just going to cover it here it's very straightforward remember at the beginning when we said these scheme panels represent the advancement of the plot so one two three four anytime the villain is told to advance you simply move them from whatever number they're on to the next number so you would advance from one to two from two to three and from three to four this again is them advancing the plot but simply you know you simply just move them here because when a card tells you to the villain schemes the villain doesn't have scheme text on their particular card the scheme is based on where they are so in the abandoned warehouse they're putting issue tokens on the sealed vault on the actual vault they're taking them off uh, here uh, it says um, they're also taking them off uh, and then here they're trying to put them on the setup card which means they're escaping with them so that was a keyword that I saw and had to took me a while longer than it should have uh, to figure out what does advanced mean for the villain advanced means simply move them to the next scheme panel and scheming you look to the scheme panel that the villain is in and crisis you always look to the special issue card that you usually set off to the side at the beginning so advance scheme and crisis those three keywords those are the locations you look uh, especially when you're taking a villain turn or an issue turn all right i'm going to now pass it back to past self villain turn you always start the game each hero takes draws a card one at a time and addresses it one at a time then we're going to flip our card over here game round continued and now we get the hero turn so the hero turn allows you to take two actions on your turn and those actions can be to draw a card if you're short on cards it can be to move around the board it can be to play an action card out of your hand 
or it can be attack or solve. And attacking and solving is when you're rolling the dice. But there's lots of other things you can do on your turn that don't cost you an action. You have two kind of action points, but again, there's things you can do that don't cost you an action point. Anytime, however, you see this symbol here, or you can see here it is real tiny in this uh, area here, that means you are gonna spend an action point to do so. So in this case, to play this card down and put it into my play area because it's got the word constant in it, I would have to spend an action, okay? Or to take her special ability, move to any space within four spaces of you and choose a hero to draw a card. So one, two, three, four. To do that, I had to spend an action and I would get to draw a card, all right? So keep an eye out for that because there are lots of cards in your hand like this one that doesn't cost a thing. I can actually play this card and since there's no action symbol down in the corner, playing this card out of my hand is completely free. And this is another constant card that gives me plus one die roll during attack actions. Well, bonus, or we have here, Rousing speech for each card in your threat area. Hero gains one focus and heals one damage. So I would gain one and heal one. If I had multiples, it would be two, three, four. But again, there's no action symbol down here. So rousing speech can be played for free. And you can see rousing speech has the keyword instant right here. That means you play it and it's discarded. Constant cards stay in your play area. Uh, instant cards are spent and then uh, dealt with. So you can see there's some instant cards that are an action. For example, this one allows you to solve, take the solve action in any scheme panel, no matter where you are. So normally to solve this scheme, uh, M Majesty has to travel over here, get to this space, and then she is teleported into this scheme panel. Once she's here, then she could take her solve action, which would be rolling dice like this. And for every success, she's putting a justice token on this. Whereas this card allows her to, she could solve from way over here. Which is good because if she were to solve and this lackey is right here, technically in this same space, he would get like a counterattack on her for solving and her trying to solve when there's a bad guy in the area. The other thing I wanna point out is that you can see here, these cards are the same. And next to color the sky, there's this little arrow on both of them. That little arrow means that this is a unique card, a unique named card, and you can only have one of them in your play area at a time. So I could not play this card at the same time. I also could not play two power of positivities to increase my dice rolls by two. I can only ever have one of these. So what would I do with this card, you might say? What's the point of having multiples of this card? Well, first of all, you can see the color of the sky allows you to exhaust, move to any space within three spaces of you. Then you may discard this card to move it to any space on the map. So essentially she's like, you know, flying way across the city, but I'd have to discard this. So then I maybe play this other one down. Or if I have this in my hand, I can spend it for this blue action here which in the winged one is take a movement action for free. Uh, you can see here, power of positivity has a fist symbol, which is the attack action. So you would get to take an attack action. You can simply discard these cards for the blue symbol on them, and it's a free action. It doesn't cost you an action token. So you, if you needed to desperately move, you could spend a color of sky, color of the sky out of your hand and um, get a free movement. Also, while we're talking about free actions, exhausting a card does not cost you an action. So it costs us an action to play color the sky, play it down, but once it's down, we can exhaust it to move three spaces. Well, that's her normal movement. So when I first read this, I was like, what's the point? You know, I'm already get to move three, color the sky doesn't give me any additional movement. Well. It allows me to either move on my turn for free without using one of my two actions, or if I needed to travel six spaces, say I was way over here, I could do my normal move, one, two, three, 
and then I could exhaust this to move three more, one, two, three. I could even discard it to fly all the way over here and end up there. Or you can see here, power of positivity gives you plus one during attack, but also you can exhaust this uh, to reduce damage by two or discard it to reduce damage to zero. So again, you can exhaust it as a free action for a little defense. At the beginning of your turn, you're always going to unexhaust any cards that have been exhausted. So exhausting allows you to use the text for free, but you only get to use it once per turn. That's pretty much it. <clears throat> um, as far as taking your character's turn. Again, once you have taken two actions that cost an action, so if you just want to solve and you don't have uh, you know, a blue symbol to spend or there's no card text that say exhaust to solve, you're going to have to spend an action. If you want to attack and you're not going to, you don't have a power of positivity or another card with a blue fist, you're going to have to spend an action. If you just need to move and you don't have color of the sky, you just need to spend an action. But once you've taken your two actions, you don't instantly go into resolving your threat phase or your threat area. You can still take exhaust actions, free actions from your hand until you have said, all right, I'm done. I, there's nothing else I can do. At that point, we're gonna resolve our threat area. So uh, let's just say, for example, we have a couple things out here in our threat area. Things are getting pretty bad for us. So we have finished our turn. We've moved around, we've done some things. Now, at the end of our hero turn, we have to resolve our threat area. And so this, if you are playing multiple people, if say Majesty completed her two actions, she needs to resolve her threat area before then the other people finish their turn. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go from left to right, resolving the activate on each card. So in this case, uh, Manufactured Hysteria says, if there are four bystanders on the map, a crisis occurs. Well, there's not, but let's just say there was, if this is the beginning of the game, you would look back to your issue card, your special card, and this says crisis, place one issue token on this card. And remember, we know that if three issue tokens make it on this card, we flip it over. It's basically opening the vault. The bad guys have opened the vault. But if there's only less than four, nothing happens. Here, we already talked about what happens when he activates, he steals a bystander, and then if there's already a bystander, he blows that bystander up. And then we would go here, the stooge would move three and inflict. In this case, he's already in the correct space with majesty, he doesn't need to move. So he would inflict for two, majesty could say exhaust this to block that two, or maybe she just takes two straight damage. This blue symbol on the card, it's a zero for him, but on other people, it may have a number in it, that's their shield. So let's just peek at Dowager here, who I know has a shield. Dowager has a shield of one, so if I hit her for four, it actually is reduced by one to three. Other than that, you just see eight health, that's how much damage you have to put on him to remove him, and two is the inflict damage he does. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty much it. So if Majesty, again, is the only character on the board here, in this case, he would move one, two, three, and go after Majesty, but uh, the lackeys will go after bystanders as well. So in this instance, he actually would not go after Majesty. He would go after the closest bystander, one, two, three, one, two, three. They're both the same distance away, so he would only get right there. But if on another turn, he can get on that same space, he actually captures this bystander, and then he places this bystander in whatever scheme location he is closest to. So in this case, it would be the blue. So that bystander is now captured in the blue uh, subway tunnels. Normally, a hero can just even pass through as long as they you know, count onto and then pass through or stop on a space with a bystander on the over map, they rescue that bystander and get a clue card. If, however, a bystander has been captured and is being held hostage in a specific location, you have to spend a justice to rescue said bystander. So um, keep that in mind. And other times, you know, having multiple bystanders in a particular area may fire off a crisis or something like that. But essentially you go through here, you activate each of your 
uh, cards in your threat area, and then you're done. So in a solo game, now we're done with our hero turn, we can move on to the issue turn. The issue turn only happens after all heroes have gone, taken their actions, resolved their threat area, everybody's taken their turn, and then as a group, you flip over and resolve the top issue card. It's very straightforward, you just read the text, it's a either or usually, if this, then do this, if not, then do this. I'm not gonna flip them over for spoilers or anything like that, but eventually it's going to push the agenda, push the plot, and that's all it does. But you only do one issue per team, per game, per round. So you do a hero, I mean a villain card per hero, but only one issue card for the group. All right, and that's, remember how we know we get nine rounds because there's nine issue cards in the deck. And that's it. After that, you would go right back. After you resolve this card, you'd go back, you'd draw a villain card, resolve it, then you get your two actions. You'd want to flip these over. Uh, I did forget one thing. At the end of your hero turn, after you have, after you have resolved the, your threat phase, you do get to draw one card. So you're not going to be, you don't have to constantly be spending an action to draw a card. You will get at least one back into your hand, basically, to start your next round. So my apologies, I did miss that. So let's talk about a few uh, specifics about things um, that I want to get into. Let's first talk about clue cards. So anytime you do anything really in the game that's positive, complete something, you gain a clue card. So if you defeat a lackey, you gain a clue card. If you uh, solve a peril, you get a clue card. If you rescue a bystander, you get a clue card. Um, and clue cards are very straightforward. They're really just bonus cards to help you get a better hand next time. So there's two things on a clue card that uh, you can use them for. The first thing is the dice. You can see here, this one actually has two. You can turn in a clue card at any time on your turn to gain that die on your next die roll. So whether it's a solve or attack action, this is gonna give you that bonus. Or you can discard it at any time to do the text in the text box. So this one says you may move. And this is a free action. So if you spend a clue card to do the text at the bottom, it does not cost you an action. So in this case, you would get an additional move. Exhaust one enemy in a hero's threat area. So that would mean you just turn it sideways and as you're going through the threat area, it actually doesn't activate. And then at the end, you would re uh, flip them back over. You may take the solve action. You may take the attack action. So these are really just kind of bonuses that you gain because you've done something positive in the game. Um, and then you can spend them at your leisure. To my knowledge, there is no limit to how many clue cards you can have. There's also no hand limit to how many action cards you can have. There is, I'm pretty sure, a limit to five focus tokens, though, per hero, which is how you flip your hero card over. Um, we'll talk about how you gain focus here in just a second. So, <clears throat> um, we talked about clue cards, we talked about peril tokens, uh, we talked about lackeys and how to put them on the board, we've talked about bystanders. Uh, again, these named tokens are going to come as a result of a specific event, either an issue card or maybe a scheme card being flipped over, and it's going to tell you to put these specific characters out onto the board. You just follow the text, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's then talk about the two major actions in the game, that's attack and solve, where you're utilizing the dice here. So on your hero card, the uh, number in the yellow POW cloud is your attack, and in the pink cloud is your solve action. So that's the number of dice you can roll to take that particular action for Majesty, it is two for both. So, if you want to solve, you either need to be adjacent to a peril token that needs to be solved, or you need to be in a scheme space to solve this, or you need to be adjacent or in the same scheme space as Dowager, something like that. Uh, as we talked about, you know, Majesty has some special cards that she can bypass that rule, but for the most part, you have to be next to or in that location. In this case, if she wanted to solve her manufactured hysteria to put 12 justice tokens on it, she would take two dice and roll them up. All right? So these dice have various 
symbols on them. The most basic of symbols is the three bursts. That's just one success. Though you can also see here's a die symbol that has three bursts, one success, plus the focus symbol, the mask. Then there's also ones with just the mask. And then there's the burst, which is the best symbol to get on the dice. So if this was your roll, you would simply get two successes. You would take two justice tokens like so, place them on whichever card you're trying to solve. All right. If, however, you roll any combination of successes with focus tokens or even just double focus tokens, in this instance, you would have the option to spend focus from your character to turn these into successes. So if I spent two focus, put them back in, those two focus symbols would become two successes. But if I don't have focus or I choose not to spend focus, to turn those into successes, I actually gain that focus at the end of this kind of activation. So I can't, you cannot say gain one focus to then turn around and spend it to turn this into a success. You gain the focus after the dice have been resolved. So you have to have the focus to begin with in order to turn it into a success. Otherwise, any focus you don't turn into a success or spend, you gain as focus. So there's no miss roll on these dice. You either are, you know, hitting successes or you're gaining focus tokens which you can then turn into successes at a later time. And then the last one here and and this one just means you get one success and then you can either turn this into two successes or gain a focus. The last symbol which there's just one side of them on but it's the best symbol is the burst symbol. If you're familiar with, you know, uh Sadler brother games you'll know that the burst what the burst symbol means that simply counts as a success but it also means you get to roll another die in and as long as you keep rolling bursts you can keep rolling there we got an extra one more dice in and so well look at that man i'm getting lucky today so even if you start with just two dice you could and you spent a focus to turn this into a success get one, two, three, four, five, six successes off of just two dice because the exploding dice could just keep going and going and going infinitely, uh, essentially. So that is really how you take the attack and solve action. If you're attacking, you simply just have to be either be adjacent to someone or be in a space with say a minion or the, you know, the villain or either adjacent on the over map or in the same scheme space on the sides of the map. Minions, <clears throat> they just take one hit and they're gone. They also hit for one and they're um, and they stay on the board at that point. But you know, Stooges have eight here. Dowager, you could see hers scales, so it's 15 per player. So for me it's just 15, but if you were playing two players, it would be 30. Um yeah, and so again, attack and solve is all about rolling out the number of dice you are allowed to roll and counting up your successes, possibly spending focus to gain additional successes. Remember, however, here her base attack is two, but with power of positivity, if she's attacking, she gets to roll three dice. So in this case, I have one focus token. So I could, this can become two successes, three, four. So I would put four, six, four hits on, say, Dowager, because I'm in the same space as Dowager, or I could put it on this Lackey, and I have to spend one, but then after I've spent it all, I gain one back in that instance. Um, if you ever try and take the solve action, and there may be times where you desperately want to just like close out this scheme card or something like that, if you take the solve action and any amount of villain, minion, or lackey is next to you or adjacent to you or in your space, after you've taken the solve action, they're going to get to hit you. They're going to inflict for their basic amount. So in this case, the minion would be one. The stooge, because he's technically in our same space, would be two more. That's three. And dowager on her scheming side is one more. So that's actually four hits that majesty would take because she took the solve action with so many other bad guys around her. Now she could flip this over and turn that into two, or she could discard it to make it be zero. Um, but again, keep that in mind that there's like a counterattack 
done by any type of bad guy if you try and solve when they're next to you or in the same space. All right, the last thing that um, I want to talk about, again, you need to unhide the villain, reveal the villain, which means you need to complete your scheme card. And there's going to be placed a number of hidden tokens on the villain based on the number of scheme cards, which is based on the number of heroes. So you have to reveal the villain. Then you have to kind of figure out what the villain's trying to do. So solve the villain by putting justice tokens, again, five per player. So for me, that's just five. When you do that, the villain is flipped over, which means now she moves down into a threat area. Whoever solved her gains her because now she has the skull. But now she has an activate. Up here, she didn't have an activate. But now she has an activate. So now when you activate your threat area, she's going to run around and smack you around. At this point, though, you can finally attack her. Anytime you attack a villain, however, you're going to after you've attacked her, you're gonna draw the top card and you're gonna resolve any showdown text that is at the bottom. If you happen to draw, like say for example, this card, this would be the best case scenario because there's no showdown text and this card is just discarded, which means this Widowmaker Peril card isn't gonna come back up. Now, if you ever run out of the villain deck, uh, you simply just shuffle the discard pile and restart it, so that could happen because um, you could be pinging Dowager for one at a time, bing, 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 and you're going to be flipping over a lot of cards just for the showdown effect. You could plow through this deck pretty quickly. But that is essentially Dowager counterattacking your attack. And then, you know, she's still going to activate during your threat area. You don't get to counter that. But, you know, as soon as you have put the amount of damage on her equal to whatever her health is, then you have won the game. And to my knowledge, that is how you win every game. You defeat the villain. There is no defeating the issue. The issue is just the plot that if it advances far enough, ends the game. The only win condition you have is defeating the villain. Now, if the, vi the villain takes um, completes her plot, completes the issue, or you run out of issue cards, you've taken too long, then you lose. There is no like defeat of heroes. If you're defeated, it's in the rule book. I'll let you read all about that. But essentially, you do some negative stuff, um, you know, that would benefit the villain, and then you draw out four more cards and you get to start again. So there is no death. Uh, there is no oh you're knocked out, you've lost anything like that. Uh, so don't quite worry about your health. But getting knocked down, it does help advance the plot and can be a negative thing. All right, that's going to do it, though, for this uh, how to play video. Uh, hopefully, I covered everything in a pretty uh, common manner. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're just going to stop the video here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer them. I am by far a pro at this game. I am not a designer of this game. So maybe if you put them in the right like Facebook group or something like that, Brady or Adam might chime in or somebody who was part of the development process, Scotty or somebody might chime in. But um, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Uh, if you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to be part of more Hour of Need content, including some playthroughs coming up, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.